My name is Omar Sanchez, and I'm a 17-year-old high school student living in a small town in rural West Virginia. My life over the last several years was unextraordinary, and until recently, I considered myself a normal American teenager. Although I'm an only child, I grew up in a loving household and was given a good start in life by my mom and dad. We aren't rich, but my family is comfortable enough. I got decent grades at school, played running back on the football team, had a close network of friends, and a beautiful girlfriend called Emily. Sure, I was a stroppy teenager, prone to occasional mood swings, and the usual high school drama. I've gotten in trouble a few times, but nothing too serious. All in all, I was a happy kid with a bright future ahead of me, as I thought about college and building a life for myself. But after the accident, everything changed, as I was forced to acknowledge that my entire existence is based on a lie. Once I tell you I was in a car crash, you'll probably imagine a horrific accident that left me broken and crippled. Well, this isn't the case. In many ways, I was very lucky. I was driving home late one Saturday night after attending a party. Thankfully, I wasn't drinking that evening, but I was driving too fast and texting at the same time, clearly a recipe for disaster. I lost control along a quiet back road a few miles from home, my car swerving off the tarmac and straight towards the solid trunk of an ancient tree. I vividly recall the moment of pure terror just before impact as I felt sure my life would end violently and prematurely. They say your whole life flashes before your eyes in the moment before a near-death experience. Well, this was the case for me, except it was someone else's life I remembered, not my own. I woke the next morning in a hospital bed, feeling pain all through my body as I groggily opened my eyes and surveyed my surroundings. My parents were standing over me, their eyes lighting up as I regained consciousness. I expected them to be mad at me for my careless driving, but instead, they were relieved that I had survived the crash in one piece. I hadn't escaped totally unscathed, however. For some reason, my car's airbag didn't deploy, and so I suffered a severe head injury, several cracked ribs, and a broken leg, which would stop me from playing football for the foreseeable future. This was the last thing on my mind, however. As soon as I awoke, I knew something wasn't right. After the crash, I felt like a totally different person, and there were images and memories in my head that I couldn't understand. I'd never been involved in a crash before in my 17 years, but the accident brought back a powerful feeling of deja vu. And there was more. A muddle of images and experiences in my head which made no sense. I tried to explain what I was going through to my parents, but they didn't understand. How could they? Mom and Dad were concerned, however, fearing that I'd suffered some sort of undiscovered brain injury. They insisted on a CT scan, which came back clear. My physical injuries weren't life-threatening, and there was no medical evidence of brain injury, so they sent me home to finish my recovery. But I knew in my heart that I wasn't okay. Far from it. I couldn't engage with my old life. I was cold with my parents, and when my friends and girlfriend came to visit me, I barely acknowledged them. I soon became a recluse, locking myself away in my room, my aching brain working overtime as I tried to make sense of the craziness inside of my head. I can't tell you how it happened, but one day, everything clicked. As a flood of memories trapped in a hidden corner of my brain suddenly came spilling out. Even then, I would have assumed this was all a paranoid delusion prompted by the trauma of the accident, but then I started looking up dates and names online and was astonished to find proof. You see, I was not always a teenage high school student from West Virginia. I had lived another life as another man, growing up in a different country far from here. I've been reincarnated somehow given a second chance as a new person in a new body. It seems I was meant to have no memory of my previous existence, but my accident and head injury must have awoken memories that were meant to be forgotten. But Pandora's box is open now, and I can't go back to my previous blissful ignorance. I also can't tell anyone about what I remember, not my parents, my girlfriend, or any of my friends or acquaintances. Instead, I've decided to share my story here in the hope that those with knowledge of the supernatural and afterlife will understand and maybe even have some sympathy for my predicament. Perhaps not, though, 
As you'll learn, my previous embodiment did something terrible and perhaps unforgivable, making a cursed deal which condemned others to suffer so he, or rather I, could have what I wanted. But if you do decide to listen on, I only ask that you reserve judgment until you know the full story. My tale begins in the early 1990s, almost 15 years before I was reborn in my current incarnation. Back then, my name was Michael Ferguson, and I was an unemployed Scotsman in his late 20s, living in a housing estate on the outskirts of Glasgow. I vividly remember my early life, my upbringing and family. I recall attending school, getting in fights, and the daily struggles of growing up in a working class area during the 1980s. I clearly remember playing and sometimes squabbling with my siblings, watching British television shows, eating haggis, drinking my first pint, punch-ups outside the pub, my first time with a girl, and working on building sites. Most of these experiences were totally alien to young Omar. I could recount my early life as Michael Ferguson, but I'm sure that would be of little interest to you. My story really begins on one cold autumn day in October 1993. I sat in my filthy bedsit, my head pounding from a hangover caused by the bottle of cheap vodka I'd downed the night before. I was in a sorry state at the time, having been laid off from my job three months earlier. I'd been unable to find another job, and my self-esteem plummeted. I spent all my money on cigarettes and booze, and fell behind with the rent and bills. I also neglected my girlfriend, Lisa, pissing her off until she eventually dumped me. The final kick in the balls came when Lisa got together with my best friend, Andy, the ultimate betrayal in my eyes, sending me further down a path of self-pity and self-destruction. I think I was at my lowest point, laying on my worn-out sofa whilst contemplating my sorry situation. On that day, I seriously considered downing painkillers with vodka to end my life. That's when she came to me. My head was still throbbing when I heard the loud knock on my front door. I groaned aloud at the unwelcome intrusion, not wishing to see anyone in my current state. It had been a while since my friends or family members had come to see me or check up on me. Frankly, I had driven them all away with my toxic behavior. I guessed the visitor was a door-to-door -door salesman or Jehovah's Witness. Therefore, I ignored the banging in the hope that they would give up and leave me alone. But this didn't happen. Instead, the banging grew louder and more persistent as the uninvited visitor almost broke my front door down. I pulled myself up from my sofa, my head still pounding as I swore angrily. All right, I'm coming. I was still full of rage as I opened the latch on my front door and was fully ready to give my uninvited visitor a piece of my mind. But then I saw her and all my anger just melted away. The young woman who stood before me was stunning. It's not just that she was physically attractive, with her long red hair flowing while her tight black business suit emphasized the curves of her body. And sure, I fancied her, but it was more than that. When I looked into her deep green eyes, I felt like I was drowning, and her sweet smile across ruby lips made my legs weak. I'd never believed in anything as crazy as love at first sight, but I did feel an instant attraction and connection with this young lady. It was like God had created the perfect woman for me and sent her to my front door during my hour of need. This was the flood of emotions I experienced in the first moment, and that was before my mystery woman had even spoken a word. I stood in the doorway, dumbstruck by her beauty and unable to speak. As it happened, she was the one to make first introductions. Hello, Michael. My name is Lilith. I'm here to help you change your life. Her voice was elegant, her words were like honey in my ears, and my feelings for her only deepened. I remained silent, not knowing how to respond to my mysterious visitor, who I now knew was called Lilith. Well, aren't you going to invite me in? She asked coyly. I stuttered in embarrassment before opening the door fully and stepping aside, muttering, uh, Yes, uh, yes, of course. Uh, please come in. Lilith smiled as she stepped inside my flat her high heels clicking on my hardwood floor. I watched her walking down the corridor, smelling her sweet perfume. I remained awestruck and infatuated as I slowly closed my front door. Now, obviously, there were a lot of red flags, which I had ignored in the moment, 
I didn't know who this woman really was or what she wanted from me. I also didn't know how she knew my first name. She introduced herself as Lilith. That name rang a bell somewhere in the recesses of my memory, but again, I couldn't quite place it. Lilith had used her beauty and charm to get through my door, but things took a darker turn once she was inside. I followed Lilith into my living room and saw her surveying the scene inside with disgust, looking at the dirty plates, half-full takeaway cartons, and assorted liquor bottles strewn across the room. She made space for her handbag on the coffee table and roughly swept assorted rubbish from the sofa before taking a seat. I really love what you've done with the place. I suddenly felt embarrassed, realizing what a bad state my home was in. Uh, yeah, uh, I know. Uh, my maid is off sick. I quipped. But Lilith didn't look impressed, looking down on me with obvious pity and contempt. I couldn't blame her. Not only was my flat filthy, but I was also a mess at this point. The clothes I wore were soiled, and I was unshaven and unwashed. Not to mention overweight and with the stink of last night's alcohol still on my breath. I was a fool to think this gorgeous young woman would ever be interested in a loser like me. Lilith sighed aloud as she shook her head. Well, Michael, we've got a lot to talk about. You best take a seat. I gulped, somehow sensing that the dynamics had changed and now I had reasons to be fearful. Nevertheless, I obeyed Lilith's command, taking a seat beside her. I was captivated by the seductive scent of her perfume, which was in stark contrast to the foul smell of my unwashed body. But she didn't recoil in disgust, instead motioning for me to come closer as she met my eye. Now, Michael, your life has taken a turn for the worst, hasn't it? My pride was wounded, and I didn't want to admit she was right. I'm going through a rough patch, but I'll get back on my feet, I said. Lilith responded with a mocking laughter. <laughs> a rough patch? That's what you call it? Well, let's sum up your situation, Michael. You lost your job. Your girl ran off with your best friend. You're a penniless drunk about to be evicted from this crappy bedsit. And you've driven away all your family and friends. And five minutes before I arrived... You were contemplating suicide. So, tell me, my friend, what exactly is your plan for getting back on your feet? I felt a sickness rising from the pit of my stomach after hearing her harsh words, and my head was suddenly filled with angry confusion. How the hell do you know all that? I demanded. Lilith smirked before replying. I know everything about you, Michael. Every dirty little secret. All your hopes and dreams. I can even tell you your future and help you achieve it. I shook my head, my heart filling with rage as I realized I was being conned. Lilith, or whatever her real name was, clearly wasn't to be trusted. She'd found out some information about me and was using it in an attempt to manipulate me. I wasn't having it, however. I stood up angrily, confronting the woman, shouting down at her. I want you to leave. I demanded firmly. That's not going to happen, Michael. Now, sit back down and behave yourself. Her condescending tone only increased my anger as I screamed. Get the hell out! Get out or I'll throw you out! She laughed in open mockery. <laughs> sure, give that a try. Let's see how it goes. It wasn't in my nature to lay hands on a woman, but I'd reached my wit's end and could take no more. I reached out to grab Lilith by the arm, but I suddenly was frozen. I literally couldn't move. My whole body was paralyzed by some unseen force. I tried to open my mouth to scream, but couldn't even manage that much, instead diverting my gaze to look down upon Lilith, a cruel smirk on her lips as she seemed to take pleasure from my situation. I think you need a further demonstration of the power I have over you. Go to the kitchen and get a bread knife from the drawer. I was baffled for a moment, until suddenly my legs started to move and I found myself walking out of the room towards my small kitchen. I tried to stop but was horrified to find I no longer had control over my legs or any part of my body. Somehow Lilith had taken control over me, 
playing me like I was her own personal meat puppet. I could only watch on in terror as my own hand pulled open the kitchen drawer and withdrew a sharp knife, and a moment later, my legs led me back to the living room where Lilith was waiting for me. Okay, good, she said coldly. Now hold the knife to your throat. My hand obeyed the order, and I was horrified to feel the cold steel against my skin. Every instinct in my body was against this, but I was totally powerless to resist. You want to die, right? Shall I cut your throat? My whole body was trembling by this point, sweat pouring from my pores and tears running down my cheeks as I tried to emit a desperate plea for mercy from my paralyzed lips. I looked into Lilith's green eyes and thought I saw a glimmer of sympathy behind her hard stare. Drop it, she ordered, and suddenly the knife fell from my hand, dropping harmlessly onto the wooden floor. Sit down over there, she said next. My legs forced me to march across the room, taking a seat facing Lilith, who was still sitting on the sofa, having hardly batted an eyelid throughout the whole ordeal. Once I sat, I suddenly regained control over my body, reacting with immense relief as I shook my arms and legs. Relax, Michael, said Lilith, her tone softening again as she made her point and demonstrated her power over me. I'm not here to kill you. Like I said, I want to help you, if you'll let me do so. I shook my head, still not believing this was really happening. I had many unanswered questions shooting through my tired brain. What are you? I asked sheepishly. Some kind of witch? She shrugged her shoulders dismissively before replying. I guess you could call me that. I've been called much worse, to be fair. She hadn't really answered my question, and honestly, I was none the wiser. I could see she was powerful, but still had no idea of the extent of her powers. Why me? Why are you doing this to me? I asked. Because you're lucky. She answered with a coy smile. I see potential in you, Michael. And so does my employer. We want to give you the chance to get everything you want in life. And what do you want in return? I asked, still feeling like I was being conned. (laughs) You're a clever man, Michael. You know there's nothing for free in this world. Yes, there's a price to pay. But that's a lot further down the line. She paused briefly, as if carefully considering her next words. Right now, you're bitter and full of rage. I get that. People have screwed you over your whole life. How the hell would you know? I interrupted angrily. Because I know everything about you, Michael. I've already told you this. But I guess you need further proof. I was frightened by her announcement because I thought that she was going to take control of my body again. But instead, she reached out and grabbed the remote control from my coffee table, using it to switch on my television set. Confused and curious, I turned my chair to face the screen, soon realizing we weren't watching one of the scheduled channels. To my astonishment, I saw myself on the screen, except I was a child once again, twelve years old and dressed in a school uniform as I walked through the playground on a dreary gray morning. I noted how my young face was filled with anxiety as I glanced from side to side. The attack came out of the blue as a much larger boy hit me from behind, pushing me down to the hard ground. The young me squealed in shock. I tried to get up to defend myself, but the bully was on top of me, holding me down as he grabbed me roughly by the collar of my shirt. Give me your money, you wee bastard! He screamed in my face. Defeated and scared, the young me pulled out a few coins from my blazer pocket and handed them over. The bully sneered as he claimed his prize, spitting in my face and kicking me hard in the belly as he walked away whilst laughing. Witnessing the old assault filled me with rage and a lot of bad memories came back to me. The bully's name was Angus and he was 14 when I started secondary school. He picked on me relentlessly, beating me up, stealing my lunch money, and generally making my life hell for the next two years until he eventually got expelled. I'd moved on from the schoolyard bullying, deciding it was just part of growing up. But seeing the young me beaten and humiliated like that brought it all back. I hated Angus all over again and wanted revenge. As always, it seemed like Lilith could read my mind, and the question she asked was exactly what I was thinking. What does a thug like that deserve? 
How should he be punished? I answered without hesitation, my heart filled with hurt and hatred. He deserves to get the living shit beat out of him. I answered firmly. Very well. Lilith answered before clicking another button on my remote, and suddenly a new image appeared on the screen. The interior of a smoke-filled public house. I saw a man playing pool and quickly recognized him. I hadn't laid eyes on Angus for more than ten years, but still I knew him at once. True, he'd put on weight and lost his hair, but the thug still maintained the same cruel look in his eyes and smug smirk on his lips. I continued to watch as he played. He was so engrossed in his game that he didn't see the trio of men approaching him, three drunks with a lust for violence in their eyes. The first commenced the attack, smashing a pint glass over the back of Angus's head. Angus screamed as the broken shards entered his skull. He swung around wildly with the pool cue, but the other attackers grabbed it from him and all three laid into him, punching him mercilessly from all sides while screaming obscenities and abuse. Soon Angus was down on the ground, rolling up in a ball in a futile attempt to protect himself. The drunk showed no mercy, however, continuing to kick him with heavy boots. Finally, the brutal attack ended as the group decided their victim had taken enough. They fled from the scene laughing cruelly as they left Angus unconscious and laying in a pool of his own blood. I was shocked, struggling to come to terms with the brutal assault I had just witnessed. Jesus! I swore. Was that real? Of course it was. Lilith answered confidently. You asked and we delivered. I shook my head in disgust, saying, I didn't ask for that. That's too much. Your exact words were, he should have the living shit kicked out of him. Don't say you didn't want this because deep down you certainly did. But is he? I couldn't speak the next words. But as always, Lilith understood me. He'll live. She answered. Now, let's move on. I didn't have time to process what I'd seen before the next image appeared on screen. I saw myself again. But on this occasion, I was all grown and at my current age. In fact, the scene I was watching was from only a few months in the past just before my life went to hell. I was in my work overalls and sitting inside a tight office. Across from me was Karen, the hard-nosed office manager of the building firm I previously worked for. She was a blonde-haired, middle-aged woman, slightly overweight and with her face caked in makeup. Karen had a reputation as a battle axe, and the scene I was reliving was a painful one for me, because Karen was in the process of firing me. Once again, rage consumed me as I watched the ugly scene unfold. I could hardly listen to her words, but remembered phrases like unsatisfactory job performance and budget cutbacks. Anyway, the bottom line was that I got dismissed without severance pay. But what really pissed me off was the smug, self-satisfied smirk on her face as she gave me my marching orders. That bitch always had it in for me. I muttered through clenched teeth. So, what's it to be? Lilith interjected. What does she deserve for taking away your livelihood? I had to think for a moment because I knew this was no longer a rhetorical question. Whatever I said should happen would play out on screen before me and presumably in real life too. I should have stopped it at that point, but I didn't. I guess the anger and bitterness in my heart was too powerful. She deserves to lose everything like I did, I eventually replied. She should lose her job. Lilith didn't say anything, instead simply pressing a button on the remote to show a new scene on my television screen. I saw Karen sitting in a room similar to the one I'd been in, getting screamed at by the company's managing director. Next, I saw her teary-eyed and defeated as she cleared the contents of her desk whilst other staff members looked on. I felt a stab of guilt as I watched the unpleasant scene play out, but Lilith didn't miss a beat. Sad but I'm sure she'll bounce back. I've got one more for you, Michael. This is a biggie. Her expression became more serious as she changed the channel and presented the next scene. My jaw dropped when I saw a very familiar couple, my ex-girlfriend Lisa and former best friend Andy. They were sitting together in a bar, sipping from drinks and laughing enthusiastically. I saw Andy move closer to Lisa, placing his hand on her thigh. She looked uncomfortable at first, but soon adjusted, taking his hand and looking longingly into his eyes. Andy whispered in my girlfriend's ear, 
His voice was soft, but somehow Lilith was able to increase the volume using the remote control, meaning I could hear him clearly. I'm telling you, baby, Michael's not good enough for you. He's a mate, but he's going nowhere. What you need is a real man. Like me. Without hesitating, Andy moved in to kiss her and she didn't stop him. I could only watch as the couple engaged in a passionate embrace. In that moment, I was totally furious. A rage built up inside me as my face went red and my knuckles turned white as I clenched my fists. I already knew they'd gotten together behind my back, but seeing the seduction firsthand made my blood boil. Lisa cheating on me was bad enough, but I'd only been seeing her for six months. Andy, on the other hand, was my oldest friend, and now I knew he'd made the first move. My anger was almost at a fever pitch, but there was worse to come, as suddenly I saw Andy and Lisa in bed together, engaging in energetic and passionate lovemaking. From the moaning sounds Lisa was making, it seemed clear she was enjoying herself very much. I felt like my head was going to explode as the anger, humiliation, and hurt overwhelmed me. I picked up an empty bottle of vodka from the coffee table and prepared to throw it at the screen with all the fury I could muster, but Lilith stopped me. No, Michael. That's not how this works. She shot me a hard look, and I backed down, remembering all too well that she could take control of my body with ease. But my raw anger didn't subside, and I couldn't calm down. And of course, Lilith asked me the inevitable question. So, what should happen to your former friend Andy? What is the appropriate punishment for a best mate who stabs you in the back? For a bastard who stole your girl and humiliated you? Making you feel like you're an inch tall, like you're not a man at all. My brain was on fire, my eyes filled with rage as I continued watching Andy and Lisa screwing in the hotel room. I should have taken a break and walked away, but I didn't. The next words I spoke were through clenched teeth, and I'll regret them for all eternity. He deserves to die. That backstabbing bastard should die for what he did to me. I glanced across to Lilith and saw a spark in her green eyes as she pressed a button on the remote. One little push that would change my life forever. The image changed and I saw a building site at dawn as construction workers began to arrive for the day. I saw Andy dressed in a hard hat and fluorescent jacket as he casually strolled toward the site, whistling as he walked like he didn't have a care in the world. The poor bastard had no idea what he was walking into. A moment later, I watched in horror as the scaffolding at the front of the half-built building creaked and then collapsed. Andy looked up at the last moment, emitting a scream of absolute terror as tons of metal and brick fell on his head, crushing his fragile body and burying him under the debris. Oh my god! I stuttered, my whole body trembling as I felt a burning pain in the back of my head. I took no pleasure from witnessing Andy's death and instantly felt extreme guilt, but I couldn't take it back. For that critical moment, I had wanted Andy dead and had spoken the words knowing what would happen. I sat, staring blankly at the TV screen, paralyzed in shock as I tried to process what had just happened. I hardly noticed as Lilith stood up and walked towards me, her high heels clicking on my wood floor. She placed her delicate hand firmly on my shoulder and I felt a surge of energy pulsing through my body, forcing me back to reality. And when I looked back into her intense green eyes, I realized we now had a bond that can never be broken. We were tied together by blood. What's done is done, Michael. She said softly. The death will be written off as an accident, and the authorities will never trace it back to you. Your life's going to change from this point onwards, Michael. Things will get better. It will be a while before we meet again. She sighed deeply, and I swore I saw a sadness in her eyes as she took her hand off my shoulder, grabbing her handbag from the table and walked out, stepping through my small flat and exiting through the front door leaving me alone and staring at a blank screen. I couldn't sleep that night, as the events of that day played over and over in my head. It was no surprise when I received a call the next day, a mutual friend telling me that Andy was dead, killed in a freak workplace accident. Somehow, I managed to drag myself to the funeral, joining the black-clad mourners at a lonely graveyard on a dreary, gray morning. I couldn't look at Andy's family during the grim proceedings. 
The thought of his grieving mother was too much. Lisa came up to me at the wake, her eyes filled with tears as she tried to reconnect. But I brushed my ex-girlfriend off, and I never saw her again. I don't know how exactly I dealt with my guilt over Andy's death. The brain is a funny thing and has a tendency to rationalize events it can't explain. I told myself that the bizarre encounter with Lilith couldn't have been real. Surely it was a delusion brought on by my depression and heavy drinking. I decided that I wasn't really responsible for Andy's death. How could I be? It was just an accident and I wasn't to blame. That's what I told myself, but in my heart I knew it wasn't the truth. I chose to ignore the sweet smell of Lilith's perfume which lingered in my flat for months until I eventually moved out. Back then, I had no real idea what I'd gotten myself into, but Lilith had been true to her word about one thing. My life did get a whole lot better. I sobered up in the aftermath of Andy's death. I was tempted to pick up the bottle and drown my sorrows, but when the alcohol hit my lips, I spat it right out again. Instead, I started getting up in the mornings, washing and shaving and getting myself back into shape. I got a new job within a few weeks and worked hard to progress my career. For the first time in months, I had money in my pocket and a newfound confidence in myself. I began dating again and had no difficulty attracting ladies, engaging in several fun but short-lived flings. But then I met Andrea. It's a strange thing because Andrea looked a lot like Lilith in a physical sense at least, with the same red hair and green eyes, but her personality was very different. Andrea was a bubbly and sweet-hearted girl who had never heard a fly. We started a whirlwind romance and got married within six months. Eighteen months after my friend's sudden death, things couldn't have been better for me. I'd started my own building firm and was making a lot of money. Andrea and I had bought our own home, a new car, and had a baby boy on the way. I had everything I'd ever wanted, but if I'm honest, I wasn't happy. I couldn't sleep at night, plagued by nightmares of Andy's death, seeing his body crushed and broken beyond repair. And Lilith, I just couldn't get her out of my mind. I thought about her every day, and often imagined I could see her, glimpsing her face on the street before she disappeared into the crowd. I didn't even know whether Lilith was real, but still I was obsessed with her, infatuated with the girl who changed my life forever. Of course, I couldn't talk about it, whether my encounter with Lilith was a false memory or not. I knew it was a secret I could never share. Unsurprisingly, the good times didn't last. It was two years after my supernatural encounter and Andy's untimely death. Andrea was six months pregnant and I was working long hours to provide. It was late on a Friday evening and I was driving home from a job. A lethal combination of hard craft and sleepless nights meant I could hardly keep my eyes open. In my exhausted state, I drove through a red light. At the last moment, I saw the truck speeding towards me, but it was already too late. The mighty vehicle struck me on the driver's side, crushing my small car and pulverizing my body. Once my brain had processed the shock, I looked down and saw my broken torso and legs, and I knew straight away I was going to die. But it was the strangest thing because I felt no pain and no fear in that final moment. Somehow I knew this was my destiny and my time had come. And in the last second before my brain died, I saw her. Lilith was standing on the dark roadside, watching over me with eyes full of sorrow, and I was happy to see her. That was Michael Ferguson's last conscious emotion before his death, and he knew, or rather, I knew, that Lilith was there to ease my passing. When my eyes closed, I had a smile on my face. And that was the end of my first existence in the mortal realm. Michael Ferguson died along a lonely Scottish road in the mid-90s, and many years later, Omar Sanchez was born in West Virginia. Two different people separated by a wide ocean, but one soul resurrected and returned to the mortal world. But that's not the end of my story. You see, I don't only remember Michael Ferguson's passing, I also recall what happened next. This is the most unbelievable part of my tale, but I swear it's the truth. My first memory after my death was awaking in a soft bed, my head shooting up from the pillow as the memory of my accident came flooding back. I was in a panic for a moment, 
but when I surveyed my surroundings, I found myself inside what looked like a five-star hotel room, complete with a poster bed, layered wallpaper, fine furnishings. The morning sunlight shone through the lace curtains, and a soft, soothing music was playing in the background, helping to put me at ease. Suddenly, the music was replaced by a gentle, disembodied male voice which spoke directly to me. Hello, Michael. Do not be alarmed. You are in a safe place, and I am here to help. Welcome to Hotel Limbo. Please make yourself comfortable, and take time to adjust to your surroundings. When you are ready, please proceed through the door to your right, and we shall commence with the orientation process. I was stunned and confused by the words, but only for a moment. Somehow, it all clicked in my head. I'd seen extraordinary things that day in my flat when she came to me. Was this all part of the plan? Was I meant to die so I could come to this place, wherever this may be? I didn't know for sure, but was desperate to find out. And so I rose from the bed, putting my feet on the soft carpet as my nostrils filled with the sweet smell of roses and I stepped towards the waiting door, a surge of energy passing through me as I placed my hands on the handle and turned it. I expected to walk out into a hotel corridor, but instead, I was surprised to find myself looking upon a luxurious office adorned with leather chairs, bookcases, and a substantial oak desk. Behind said desk sat an amicable, elderly, white-haired man, dressed in an immaculate tuxedo suit, smiling at me as his eyes lit up in anticipation. Ah, Michael. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. He stood up from his armchair and held out his hand for me to shake. I did so and felt a warmth flowing through me. Please, take a seat. I willingly accepted his offer, sitting on a soft leather armchair opposite to this mystery man. He continued to smile softly, his warm eyes looking upon me sympathetically as he spoke. Well, Michael, I don't want you to panic, but I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. There's no point in sugarcoating it, my friend. You're dead. He looked upon me cautiously, as if expecting me to break down or lose my mind. I think my response greatly surprised him. I know. I replied abruptly. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> that's very good. Most who arrive here haven't come to terms with their new situation. It's good that you are so... accepting. This will save me a lot of time. So, this is the afterlife? I asked nervously. In a manner of speaking. The man replied. At the Hotel Limbo, we helped prepare the recently deceased for the next stage in their journey. This is a place of transition and, I'll be honest, there is some red tape to go through, I'm afraid. I felt a cold chill, my heart breaking because I knew my reckoning was nigh. I stuttered my next words through trembling lips, asking, Are you God? The old man laughed softly before answering. <laughs> Goodness, no, no. I am a mere servant, a representative, if you will. But don't worry, Michael. I'm not here to judge you, only to help you. But you decide where I'll go, I demanded as my patience was stretched to the breaking point. Yes, he replied less confidently. There is a process to go through, but it's really nothing to worry about. Perhaps it's better if I show you. He clicked his fingers and prompted a set of red satin curtains behind his desk to pull open, revealing a large black television screen which suddenly burst to life, showing images and wonders beyond my wildest dreams. The first place he showed me was one of light, life, and happiness. I saw green fields and clear streams under blue skies and a bright sun which illuminated a peaceful land. I witnessed beautiful structures white marble towers and castles with stunning spires which looked like something from a fairy tale. The land was full of life, the sweet songs of birds filling the air and deer roaming majestically through the fields and forests. The people I saw on screen were of all races and creeds. They dressed in white robes, wandered through the countryside, appreciating every flower and creature they encountered as if their senses were somehow heightened. Others worked in the castle, toiling on projects which engaged their passions, riding, singing, and building. All looked content and satisfied. The final scene was a grand feast held in a great hall with long tables filled to the brim with food and delicacies from around the world. 
The dinner guests drank, ate, and laughed merrily as they enjoyed the feast and each other's company. All were happy, and not one argument was had. Heaven, I muttered, my eyes focused on the wonderful images. Yes, it's quite something, isn't it? The man exclaimed with a smile. It looked too good to be true, and I knew this wasn't where I was headed. There are other places, though, aren't there? I muttered. The man nodded as if he'd anticipated my question. Yes, that is true. Honestly, few folks make it to heaven the first time around. We're not all saints, after all. <laughs> the man chuckled, but was met by my stone-cold face as he continued in a more serious tone. Purgatory. The likelihood is that you'll go there. At least for a while. There's always a price to be paid. Can I see it? I asked impatiently. Of course. The old man clicked his fingers again, and a series of images appeared on screen. I saw ugly, grey buildings under an even greyer sky as a constant cold rain fell to earth. Thousands of unhappy people walked along a crowded pavement, shoving each other as they rushed from place to place and were soaked to the skin. And in the alleyways of the main streets, mangy rats and pigeons fought over scraps from overturned bins. Next, I saw people at work, standing in assembly lines and sitting in tied office cubicles their heads down and eyes devoid of passion as they completed tedious jobs without purpose. And finally, I watched a sad-looking man sitting down alone to what looked like a cheap microwave meal, sighing loudly as he forced the unappetizing food into his mouth. Not the most pleasant place, but it could be worse, the old man said with an awkward smile. Indeed, I thought, but didn't say. Purgatory looked pretty miserable, but in truth, it didn't seem too different from the mortal realm, but I knew he wasn't telling me the whole story. There was more to come, and I needed to see it. What about the other place? I said firmly. What about hell? I swore I could see some color drain from the old man's wrinkled face as his jaw dropped and eyes widened. Hell! He exclaimed in shock. Oh, you shouldn't be worrying about that place, young man. You're not the type to end up there. I want to see it. I demanded. I think my determination shocked him as he reluctantly submitted to my wishes. Very well, Michael. I will show you. But I warn you that it won't be pleasant viewing. I thought I was ready for what was to come, but the horrors I witnessed on screen were beyond my worst nightmares. I saw a dead land shrouded in darkness, and a ring of naked, emaciated bodies secured in chains and marching in a circle. All were forced to hold heavy rocks and were whipped by a snarling, demonic beast. A twenty-foot-tall monster with horns upon its head and hooves instead of feet. Its eyes burnt a fiery red, and when it opened its terrible maw, I saw its mouth was filled with rows of shark-like teeth. The demon cackled cruelly as it snapped its huge whip, the cat of nine tails striking the bare skin of the damned as they cried out in agony. Next, I witnessed a horrifying walled city of crumbling bridges and military structures, the brickwork assaulted by heavy rain and constant lightning strikes from a starless, dark sky above. The rubble-strewn streets were home to running battles fought by soldiers from throughout history, everything from Roman legionnaires to First World War infantrymen. They hacked at each other with axes, swords, and bayonets, indulging in a bloody, senseless slaughter as the heavy rains washed away the blood. I looked on in horror as winged demons, harpy-like beasts, ascended from the dark skies to feed upon the wounded soldiers, slicing up their bellies and devouring their guts as the still-living men squirmed and screamed. Finally, I saw a beach of burning sands set along a lake of sulfur and fire, yet more naked souls ran in utter terror along the beach, their feet burning as they fearfully looked up at the sky above them. I soon witnessed the horror they were fleeing from. Suddenly, a huge predator ascended from the skies, a jet-black dragon the size of a bus with burning red eyes and a terrible maw which breathed fire, incinerating the damned in a fiery inferno before grabbing their burnt corpses in its mighty talons, ripping the charred bodies to shreds before feasting on their warm flesh. My god. I uttered in disbelief, my body trembling as my brain processed the horrifying images I had just witnessed. The old man also seemed disturbed, and perhaps embarrassed as he stuttered his next words. Yes, well, I did try to warn you. 
but the smile returned to his face as he added, But you shouldn't worry, Michael. I've read your file and you're not the type to end up in hell. Eternal damnation is for unrepented sinners, tyrants, child molesters and murderers. All of the bad sort. His grin widened as he tried to reassure me, but it was no good. I felt that familiar sickness in the pit of my stomach and the burning in the back of my head, realizing that I could still experience guilt even after death. I kept reliving that moment back in my filthy bed scent two years before as Lilith showed me those images of Andy seducing my girlfriend. I vividly recalled the rage I'd felt and the words I'd spoken. He deserves to die. I was a murderer, yet somehow they'd missed it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here, I suppose. I could have kept my mouth shut and hoped for the best, but I knew I couldn't live for all eternity with this guilt. I opened my dry lips and prepared to speak, but suddenly the office door shot open and a furious figure charged in. I looked up and was captivated by those green eyes and flowing red hair, my heart missing a beat as I set eyes upon my beloved. The woman who barged into the office was Lilith, and she was mad as hell. The mild-mannered elderly man reacted with surprise to the unexpected intrusion, crying out, What is the meaning of this? How dare you interrupt my meeting? Shut your mouth, old man! This soul is mine! I looked up at the fire in Lilith's eyes, awestruck by her presence as all the passion I'd felt two years ago came flooding back. The man behind the desk was taken aback, stuttering his reply. I'm afraid you must be mistaken. Michael here is being processed for the afterlife. All very routine. You idiots have screwed up again? Lilith exclaimed angrily. Michael belongs to me. A deal was made and sealed in blood. I saw the shock in the man's eyes, his jaw dropping as his whole tone and demeanor changed. He shot me an accusatory glance before asking, Is this true, Michael? I felt ashamed my dark secret was finally exposed. I couldn't answer verbally, so instead nodded my head meekly as I admitted my guilt, avoiding the man's eyes as I did so. Oh, he replied, the disappointment clearly evident in his voice. Well, Mr. Ferguson, I'm afraid there's nothing more I can do for you. He nodded towards Lilith before saying, You may take him. I experienced a terrible sinking feeling as I looked into her intense eyes. Come on, Michael. Let's go, she demanded. I looked back at the old man behind the desk, silently begging for his support, but his back was turned to me, his chair now facing the far wall. Resigned to my fate, I stood up on my trembling legs and followed Lilith to the door. It was the same entrance I'd come through, but somehow I knew it wouldn't lead us back to the luxurious hotel room. Lilith put her slender hand on the door handle, opening it to reveal my own personal hell. I stood in the doorway in stunned silence, hardly believing what I saw. It was an exact replica of my decrepit, dirty bedsit from two years ago, right down to the empty vodka bottles and stained sofa. To my horror, I realized I was being returned to the lowest point of my life, back when I was on the brink of suicide and just before Lilith came to me. I looked to Lilith, tears in my eyes as I pleaded for mercy. Please, please don't make me go back there. I swore I could see some empathy in her eyes, although her voice didn't falter as she answered firmly. You must. There is no choice. But then she did something unexpected, reaching out to take my hand in hers. It's okay. I'll be there with you. I felt a warmth flow through me and drew strength from hers, putting a foot forward and stepping into the hellish replica of my former home. As soon as we were inside, the door slammed shut behind us, and I realized I was trapped. I panicked in the first few moments, Lilith standing back as I tore through the small flat, desperately searching for a way out. The front door was firmly locked, and all the windows were bricked up, the only light coming from dim electric lamps which could never be switched off. I banged my fists against the walls and the door, trying in vain to break out until eventually I exhausted myself collapsing down on the uncomfortable sofa and crying in angry frustration. Lilith sat beside me, placing her hand on my shoulder. You need to adjust, Michael. This is your home now. She said softly. I reacted with anger, slapping her hand away and screaming in her face. You tricked me! It's your fault that I've ended up in this hellhole! Lilith shot a look at me, which instantly made me regret my outburst, and when she next spoke, her words were harsh and to the point. 
Don't kid yourself, Michael. I told you there would be a price to pay. I didn't force you to do what you did. My head dropped and heart sank because I knew Lilith was right. The words I'd spoken two years before kept repeating in my head. He deserves to die. A difficult silence ensued before we were interrupted by a loud knock on the front door. I jumped up in surprise, but Lilith didn't flutter an eyelid, as clearly she had expected this visitor. You need to get that, Michael. She said solemnly, as the knocking grew even louder. With considerable reluctance, I got up off the sofa, glancing back at Lilith momentarily before I slowly walked towards the front door a terrible sense of impending doom building up inside of me as I reached out for the doorknob. The door, which was now unlocked, opened to reveal what looked like the interior of an elevator, but I was shaken to my very core when I saw the figure standing on the other side. It was Andy, my former best friend who I'd effectively murdered two years before. Or perhaps it was a demonic entity who'd taken the form of my late friend. In any case, the sight of him chilled me to the bones as I saw the dried blood on his forehead, the cruel smirk on his lips, and a fiery hatred in his eyes. When he spoke, it wasn't Andy's voice, as the tone was deep and inhuman. Hello, mate. Remember me? It's payback time, you bastard! He clenched his fist and stepped forward menacingly. I backed off, raising my hands defensively as I pleaded for mercy. The first punch hit me like a ton of bricks, knocking me down to the ground. He didn't pause before striking me again and again, first with punches and then with hard kicks from his heavy work boots. I screamed in pain and terror as Andy's vicious attack continued unabated. Midway through, I glanced up with blood in my eyes and saw Lilith standing in the doorway of the living room, watching as the violent assault upon me played out. There was a sadness in her eyes as she looked on, but she made no effort to intervene or stop the attack. I felt myself losing consciousness as the pain overwhelmed me and I thought Andy would beat me to death, but he stopped his assault abruptly, walking away from my bloodied body whilst laughing sadistically and saying, So long mate, see you soon! Lilith came to my side as soon as the front door closed helping me to my feet and guiding me to the bedroom where she gently laid me down on the mattress. She spoke in a soft and soothing tone, holding my hand as she whispered, It's going to be okay, Michael. You're going to be fine. She lay with me in the bed, holding my broken body whilst comforting me. She must have used her powers to heal my wounds because all my cuts, broken bones, and bruises disappeared within a few short hours. I felt relief and gratitude looking into Lilith's deep eyes and experiencing a wave of emotions. Instinctively, I leaned forward intending to kiss her, but Lilith backed away to prevent it. I felt embarrassed, not knowing what to say or do, but then there was another ominous knock on the door and my heart froze with terror because I knew what this meant. Andy, or whatever demon had possessed his body, was back to deliver yet another savage beating. And so, that became the pattern for I'm not sure how long, as Andy beat the living shit out of me and Lilith nursed me back to health, only for the whole hellish routine to repeat again and again. Don't get me wrong, I didn't meekly submit to my torment. On several occasions I attempted to fight back, only to be easily overpowered by the creature who'd taken my friend's form. One time I managed to get past him, through the door and into the elevator which had transported the beast, only to find there were no buttons inside to operate the lift. And of course, Andy dragged me out, kicking and screaming, before delivering another savage beating. Lilith wasn't always there to witness the assaults, but she always arrived in the aftermath to heal my injuries, materializing out of thin air by some kind of dark magic. I felt my feelings for her grow during this time, as she offered the only glimmer of hope I had in this hell of my own making. She held me, and I felt warm and safe, for a while at least. Just to be clear, our relationship remained essentially platonic. I had no sexual desire in that place. Nevertheless, she became my whole world during that awful time. On one occasion, after a particularly savage beating, I asked her the question which had been playing on my mind for so long. Why? I asked weakly. Why did you bring me here, and why did you do this? There was an awful sorrow in her green eyes and a lengthy pause followed before she finally answered. I'm trapped here, the same as you. 
The demon who beats you captured my soul a long time ago. He forces me to act as his siren and draw in others. Like you. Together we trick unfortunates into those damned blood packs so he can torment them for all eternity. She sobbed softly before continuing. I hate myself for what I've done. If I could go back, I would never have chosen you, Michael. I'm so very sorry. I nodded my head upon hearing her words. Honestly, this is more or less what I'd suspected, so I was not surprised. It's okay, I finally answered. It's not your fault. We've both done bad things, and we can't change the past. I sighed deeply before finishing my sentence. I only wish there was a way out for us. Lilith's eyes lit up before she replied. Maybe there is. For one of us, at least. I frowned, failing to understand her cryptic words. What do you mean? Just wait and see, answered Lilith with a wink and a smile. And so I did. I didn't know how long I was trapped in that hell or how many times I was beaten, but I vividly recall the day when everything changed. I answered the door as usual, my body trembling as I saw Andy marching towards me, his fists clenched and eyes full of sadistic glee as he prepared to launch his latest attack. I didn't plead for mercy or attempt to defend myself, knowing both would be futile. Instead, I closed my eyes and prepared for the inevitable. But suddenly, there was a loud cry from behind in a voice I knew all too well. Leave him be! Enough is enough! The look on Andy's face was initially one of shock, but this soon turned to fury as his eyes burned and he spat out his angry words. Damn you, Lilith! How dare you challenge me! Stay the hell out of my way! Lilith responded with defiance, stepping forward and pushing past me positioning herself between me and my demonic attacker. No, I'm not doing this anymore. I watched on helplessly as the demon screamed with fury and attack, swinging his fist as he struck out at Lilith, but she responded in kind, parrying his blow and shoving him with all the strength in her body. Andy was taken off guard, flung backwards into the elevator, his body crashing heavily against the cold steel. Lilith stormed forward, reaching for the handle to slam the door shut, but the demon masquerading as Andy cried out his parting words, You're gonna pay for this! And then she shut the door, trapping him on the other side. Lilith glanced back at me, her expression still one of fiery defiance, as she'd finally stood up to her devilish master. But I felt a cold chill as I recalled the demon's parting threat. My god, what have you done? I muttered fearfully and Lilith's eyes filled with a raw terror. She left me soon after, and it was some time before I saw her again, leaving me to sit alone in my prison and imagine all the terrible things that might have happened to her. Then one day, I awoke to find her sitting at the end of my bed, watching me as I slept. I couldn't contain my relief and excitement at seeing her again, and hugged her in a passionate embrace. But when I saw her face, I realized something was wrong. She looked drained and exhausted, as the fire behind her eyes had faded. What happened? What did he do to you? I asked with concern. She shook her head before replying. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that you're getting out. What do you mean? I exclaimed in confusion. You're getting off on a technicality. Seems I didn't inform you of the terms and conditions when we made our deal. You'd be surprised at all the red tape in the afterlife. She smiled faintly before continuing. Anyway, what matters is you're getting a second chance. A whole new life. And you won't remember any of this nightmare. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, nor did I understand. What about you? I exclaimed in panic. Aren't you coming with me? She avoided my gaze, pushing me away as she answered. I can't. My deal is still intact. And there's a price to be paid. I shook my head in defiance, saying, I won't leave without you. You must. Lilith replied as she took my hand and looked deeply into my eyes. I'll never forget you, Michael. She leaned in to kiss me, and I experienced a surge run through me as her lips touched mine. An electricity which awoke something buried deep inside of me. And when she withdrew, I suddenly felt lightheaded, quickly losing consciousness as everything started to go black and the last thing I saw before the darkness took me was Lilith's face, a soft smile on her lips and a tear in her eye as she watched me go. 
And so, this is my story. That was my first life, death, and temporary stay in a hellish realm. Michael Ferguson died in Scotland in a car accident in 1995. I was able to confirm as much from archived news reports from the time. He left behind his widow Andrea, and the son he'd never met was born three months after his death. That's right, I have a son who's older than I am, Michael Mike Ferguson Jr. I found his profile on Facebook and felt like someone had stepped over my grave when I saw his photograph. I thought about contacting him, but what would I say? How could I explain any of this? So, Michael Ferguson died in 1995, and Omar Sanchez was born in 2007. That means my soul spent 12 years being tormented in that hellish realm before Lilith set me free. If she hadn't done so, I'd still be there now. But instead, I'm living the life of a teenage high schooler in the States. And if it hadn't been for my head injury, I wouldn't remember any of this. And I'd probably be happier for it. But the cat's out of the bag now, and I can never go back to that blissful ignorance. I can't stop thinking about Lilith and the sacrifice she'd made to save me. I know she's suffering on the other side, tormented by that vile demon as he punishes her for the betrayal. I can't accept this, however. Despite everything, I still care deeply about Lilith, and I won't rest until I rescue her. I don't know how I'll achieve this, not yet anyway. I've already died once, and I'm in no rush to do so again. Besides, there's no guarantee that I'll return to the same place. Such is the disorganized nature of the afterlife and the confusing bureaucracy. But I have to do something. I'll speak with priests, mystics, mediums, demonologists, and paranormal investigators, anyone who might have a way to communicate with the other side. I don't care if it takes the rest of Omar's natural life, but somehow I'll find a way. I'm coming to save you, Lilith and we'll be together for all eternity. This is our destiny, and I'll never stop fighting for you. Hello, everybody. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that story. Real quick, I just want to give an update on the channel. As some of you may know, I've been uh, kind of busy the last two weeks. I had family visiting from out of town, and then over the last week, uh, I was camping with a friend. And so I just got back from that, and yeah, I'm working on some new videos for you all. So with this story, I like this one. This one is by Woundlicker, who has a bunch of stories on the channel. I'm sure you all recognize the name. But one thing I like about this story is Lilith. At first, I thought she was going to turn out to be evil or she was a demon, you know, just based on the name. But then it turns out that she's just another person like the main character who's also trapped in a shitty situation. And I thought that was pretty interesting because throughout the whole story, I was expecting her to just turn at any moment and reveal her sinister motives or whatever. But outside of that, the story was kind of like low key, just like chill. There wasn't a whole lot that happened in terms of like action or anything like that. So this one, like the last few ones I've done, have been kind of sparse on the sound design, mostly focusing on the ambience and just kind of like listening to the events of the story without much direct immersion into the events that are happening, if that makes sense. And this story goes along with a bunch of other hell-related stories that I've been doing lately, uh, some of them by this author and some not. But a bunch of you have expressed that you really enjoy the like religious theme stories or the ones centered around hell. And I'm really interested to see what you thought of this one. And I don't really have too many thoughts on this one other than I like it and, you know, I hope you do also. Now that I'm back from my trip, I have a bunch of other videos planned for you. Some longer ones like Pen Pal, which I've been working on for quite a while here. Now, the reason that one's taking a bit longer than most other ones is because I've been working on a lot of new music for it. I've been aiming to write a song for each chapter, and I think there's about seven or eight chapters in Pen Pal. And so each one has its own theme song that correspond to the event of that particular part. So yeah, that one will be out soon. I really hope you enjoy it. 
And then other than that, some other stories that I'm planning for the future are a redo and completion of the series SWAT officer stories, which is another story by Mr. Outlaw that is connected to the secret government prison series. In addition to the other one, which is called My Best Friend's Been Living in an Alternate Reality. And once I get those ones out, I plan on releasing my narration of Tales from the Gas Station, which I'm hoping to collaborate with a bunch of other narrators from the community on. But those are the bigger projects I have in mind that I'm working on. I'll also be releasing some shorter stories like I usually do, you know, 30 minute long ones or 40 or 50 minute long ones. But yeah, I'm excited for all the videos I have coming up. Uh, like I said before, I'm excited to see what you think of this video in the comments. And I hope you have a good weekend.